Vigna. We are Vineyard. Any ministry, I think, that shows kindness is helpful for folks who are fleeing their home country and navigating a hostile land. Mm. Um, I think often, and I don't work in a Christian law firm, so it's not a context where we're sort of like free to, and now let's do prayer ministry, you know, but right. everything within me wants to sometimes just like, you know what folks need is like a kind, just kindness, like a kind mm. and compassionate person to like lay a hand on their shoulder and bless them and give them a prophetic word and minister. Like the power of what we do just, we just by default, we leaks out of us as the vineyard. Yeah. It would be such a healing balm for the community that I represent. Because to be an immigrant in America is a lot of hard things, mm -hmm. especially when you're not coming at the invitation of America. Welcome to the We Are Vineyard podcast, conversations to help us grow with Jesus and each other. In today's episode, our host, Jay Pathak, talks to Tina Colon williams Tina is an immigration attorney at Esperanza Center for Law and Advocacy and serves at Elm City Vineyard as a worship pastor. Let's listen in. Tina, thanks for being on our podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, it'll be great. I We've gotten to hang out a whole lot, but as I've done this now, I don't even know how many times, there's always something I learn new about somebody, even though I already knew their story. You know, we've... Oh, I'm sure. We've sat on my back porch or in your front room getting to know each other for years and years now, but but I'm, I'm excited. I really appreciate taking time. So, so uh, we start where where it all starts, which is, where were you born? Birth. I was born in <laughs> yeah, that's Jacksonville. A good, that's a good starting place. <laughs> I was born on a cold winter. <laughs> yeah, uh, in Jacksonville? Yeah, not very Jack cold. Cold yeah. for Jacksonville. <laughs> Still cold for me. I never quite adjusted from Jacksonville weather, um, mm -hmm. unfortunately, since I live in New Haven, Connecticut. But wow. I was born in Jacksonville, Florida on December 27th, 1987. Yeah, so it was super cold. It was like... 65. <laughs> it gets down there. So if you ask my mom, who is from Puerto Rico, she will report during the winter and just talk about how, Tina, it is freezing. It was below freezing today. You know, in the winter, she'll be wearing the turtlenecks and the down totally. coats meant for negative 20 degrees. And it's totally. like 37 max. But yeah. Yeah. My parents live on the Gulf Coast and they literally won't come here unless it's like the middle of the summer now up to Denver because mm -hmm. it's just too cold. I don't blame that. It's not unreasonable. <laughs> yeah, it's so unreasonable. Anyway, <laughs> okay. It's miserable. So you're born in Jacksonville. Yes. And your parents are from Puerto Rico? Yes. They're okay. both born and raised in Puerto Rico. Speaking of cold, they ended up leaving the island directly as adults after they got married mm -hmm. to move to Rochester, Minnesota. Wow. Which is a very cold why would they, why did they do that? No, they for real, probably, like that's real. <laughs> what, like, what reason could they possibly have exactly. had? Um, so they met in school at the University of Puerto Rico. Mm. Uh, and then when they graduated, they both ended up going to medicine, went to medical school at the University of Puerto Rico. Mm. And then they both, whatever comes after medical school, they got into that at Mayo Medical in wow. Rochester, Minnesota. So it was for school. And my dad went first, and then my mom went, and it was a cold, cold place. And they had my older brother, and then they moved to Jacksonville at the initiation of Mayo Clinic Jacksonville. Mm. And then I emerged shortly thereafter. So then wow. my dad still works at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. Wow. Um, what kind of medicine works. do they practice? They do so much stuff. I had a moment relatively recently every once in a while it comes up where i'm like wait my parents are bosses like they're so yeah. smart um my dad is a oncologist hematology oncology and then my mm. mom does pediatric endocrinology and they both do research and so my mom studies hormones and and, and uh, estrogen and growth hormone and all sorts of things and travels a whole bunch for that so i actually even really young got 
to go with my mom, mostly all around the world for these like medical conferences. I'm like the youngest person at these dinners and these, you know, presentations. And then you go travel around. <laughs> wow. It's wild. Yeah. Wild. So but they they're... love, love what they do. That's super bright people. I mean, that's like smart people stuff to do that kind of medicine. Yeah. And my dad, like apparently he went to college for only like two years and then went to medical school and like they both graduated high school early and they're just, they're just smarty pants. Yeah. And is that like the whole, is that like the whole family tree? I mean, it's just people who I'm sure are highly I don't educated. Know. I don't know much about my family tree beyond mm. grandparent level, um, but they are first generation college, first mm. generation high school grad. What your parents they did not grow up. Mm -hmm. They did not grow up in a super educated, um, particularly upwardly mobile environment. They both grew up super, super poor, actually. Um, mm. And I think that they found both of them individually found school and study to be this place of like alternative and escape. And they just crushed it. Well, in that sense, that is the American dream. Like living it, living it. I mean, like. And, and I mean, of course, that is the sort of I mean, of course, I, I know where we're going with some of your story and what you do. But I mean, that is the dream immigrant story, right? Like grew up poor, not the opportunities. Education creates like a a new world, a new opportunity that mm -hmm. really because I know what you do then, of course, being in New Haven where Yale is. I mean, that's mm -hmm higher level education <laughs> it would be an understatement but but to see within then two generations like that's that's a major shift in the way correct yeah okay okay so they're, they're studying dream medicine you're born in jacksonville and are you raised and you're the how many siblings do you have I have two brothers, one two. older, one younger. Oh, okay. So you're right in the middle. Okay. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Middle child, but only girl. So you yeah, have okay, so, like, I'm not special. Yeah. That, that'll make you, <laughs> yeah. That only girl that, that changes things. Okay. And so, so you're raised in faith and church. Like, is that like normal? So much church. So, so much church. So, so, much. so much church. So my mom, um, in addition to being like, world-renowned scientist is a flutist and plays the flute. Um, she went to wow. high school at the school, um, but also like a, studied at a conservatory at the same time and like plays the flute. So she was always on the worship team. She actually came to faith as a teenager in Puerto Rico in a community that sounds, when she describes it, very similar to the Vineyard in terms mm. of the Jesus People movement, kind of this alternative community encountering the Holy Spirit in these really real ways and coming alive in different ways and drawing together kind of a ragtag bunch to follow Jesus. And so that's where she came to faith out of um, sort of a more traditional cultural Catholicism and then ended up bringing her whole family along with her. So by mm. the time I came around, she was very much like, church was a given. It wasn't like, oh, maybe we'll go, maybe we won't. We will absolutely right. go, um, and it will be long. <laughs> to, it will uh, be all day. Right, right. <laughs> She played the flute, right? So, I'm so she would come early and stay late and was super involved. And um, growing up when I was younger, we actually all went to essentially a bilingual, like Hispanic church in Jacksonville. Um, and just culturally, the, the services were longer. So it wasn't just mm. like getting there early and staying late. The services themselves were long. The worship, mm. like you'll sing the same chorus forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You know, people are feeling all the things and they're falling over and then eventually. So it's like on. Pentecostal. Oh, full on. That's so great. And so, <laughs> and so does your dad do music as well or is it just your mom? Not at all. No. And so growing up, my dad, I think was more reluctant to, I mean, he, he would comply. My mom in the, in the household, my mom is, is the. She makes know, it go. She's yeah. the, she's the. <laughs> She's a boss in many ways. Um, and so just kind of would set the tone for the family outings. And so we would go to church and it wasn't like it wasn't like an, an option for anyone. It was just a, a given. Right. This and is so what we're doing. Right. This is what we are all doing. Um, and so I think earlier on, my father probably was more like, I'm coming because we must. And then eventually sort of came into his own faith wise in a different mm. way. But yeah, we were all very much a church church home. But both come from historically Catholic families. Very much so. Then she Very has these encounters so. of God, her whole family kind of comes in through that. 
Mm-hmm. So like for you, was that stuff and maybe even for your brothers, I mean, as like a family, you're like, this is the best. Or is it like, oh, my gosh, what are we doing? Why are we doing all this? <laughs> I mean, there's different <laughs> stages, but. Correct. Correct. We all related very differently to church. I think um, it wasn't always this is awesome for all of us. Um, mm. And we all had our different journeys. So in that phase of church, I think church was more spectacle than mm. like meaningful place of personal encounter. Right. Um, so it was because there was so much dramatic, charismatic stuff going on. Um, it was more something that I would watch and observe as I guess there are particular holy people who are having particularly holy moments mm. and I'm like giggling at it or, you know just observing other people have these moments. And so it, and then, and then, which, which eventually becomes quite boring. Right. So it wasn't particularly meaningful in that sense for quite a while. And so we ended up leaving and switching churches and eventually ended up in a church that had a youth group that was very, very intense. And in that context, there was, it was the first time that things were made in a church context, accessible and expected for everyone Mm. to, engage rather than just like us if, if you're holy enough you'll catch it or whatever right right oh that's interesting and so can you remember even as a kid having like personally like encounters with god or one of the first times that you start going wait a minute this is for me i mean was that all the way in in youth group or was it there were a couple moments because i i i as the only girl i think ended up in the most sort of like receptive to faith stuff Mm. ended up tagging along with my mom whenever she would do worship things even outside of Sunday. Mm. So I'd be sitting there, you know, like a young person, people are having these experiences. And though for the most part, it is sort of this like sitting in the back and like observing. There were a couple of moments where, you know, in the in in the context of worship or I would I would sort of like have these moments where it felt like the presence of God. Mm. But I mostly would encounter God in the Bible, even as like a young person, mm. I perhaps it's because of the parents I was born to. I've always been a nerdy person um, and <laughs> always found so much in like books. And so I was reading books all of the time, mm. sneaking books at the t- like just reading books, always checking out the like ginormous stack of books at the library every mm. single couple weeks. Um, and among those books were just like all of the Bibles, like the kid Bibles, you know, or, and then eventually like actual Bibles. I remember like being like, I'm going to read the Bible now, like reading it, like trying to read it cover to cover as like uh-huh. a 12 year old. And I'm just like, what are these like cubits? I, why do people read this? Yeah. And then I got to the gospels and I'm just like, this is the same thing over and over. Why do they keep telling this? This must be a mistake. Um, so I didn't really have tons of context for walking me through the Bible or explaining the Bible, right. but I would just pick it up and read it because that's what I did as a young person. I would read everything. Huh. And there were these moments in in the stories of scripture where I would, I felt like even as a kid was encountering something more alive than I was used mm. to in the kinds of books that I would read. And so um, that was always a point of like curiosity for me, just like there's that's something here. I'm very intrigued. And so keep coming back to it, but would rarely have those sorts of what does this mean? Does this apply to someone's actual life? Right. Um, and more sort of as a fantastical story that I observed again until until a youth group age when there was actual context for teaching the Bible mm. to young people and expecting that to like make a difference in their day-to-day life. Well, and I know music is a big part of your life. So were you playing music all the way through? I mean, from when you were a little kid, are you playing keys and singing and not singing. So I actually didn't pick up singing until around middle school. Really? I hmm. played piano since I was like I don't know, five or six or seven, but it was always classical piano. So I played classical mm. piano and I did like competition and was just like learning all the things and playing sheet music and not church music really. Right. Um, and I didn't sing. I enjoyed singing. Everyone, all the women in my family. So my mom is one of five sisters. Really? And anytime I was and time with them they're just people who sing not in a performative way but in a constant way like i'll be at the grocery store with my mom and she's like singing as she's checking out and she's singing as we're like getting food and then we're singing in the house as we're cooking and it's just there's always singing um so i think singing was in the water but i never 
saying in front of others until really like I made friends with this other girl, this other equally nerdy girl in middle school. (laughs) We became friends and she was confident that she wanted to be a pop star. Mm -hmm. And so she was like, had these little performances. Sometimes it's Tina saying, with me i'm nervous and i would be the harmonizer and then over time we're like wait we're kind of good at this and so i would sing more and then also around the same time switch churches started that youth group and they did these musical things every once in a while so every once in a while i started singing there and and then it turned around to being more singing wow that's okay okay but let let me back up because first of all you just said something that i didn't know that's interesting to me just personally your mom is one of five girls? Correct. Is, where is she in the order? That's a good question. Third? Not first. Fourth. 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 Not first. Because so, you, 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 you might know this, you don't, but Danielle is one of five girls. Really? Yeah. She's the it's oldest. A lot of girls. It's a lot of girls. And I don't think I've ever met another family of just five girls. I'm not, I, so anyway, that's... Yeah, that is a lot. That's a lot of girls. Lots that's of a lot. <laughs> Said a guy Powerful who ladies. married into that. Yeah, it's a lot. Of, it's a lot yep. of girls, especially when I was, <laughs> so you know, an only child. <laughs> yeah, I had the, exactly. I have no siblings. I like, wow, this is a lot. Oh, like instantly. Only child. My dad to... has one sister. So. OK, yeah. OK. So you start you start. <laughs> so you're really, a, you know, a pianist and then you start to sing a little bit. So, mm-hmm. okay, so I, I have like too many questions at once, but but then when you start to sing in this youth group, that that's when it starts. When did you start writing or thinking about writing music? Because you write beautiful music too. Thanks. The um, I remember the first song I ever wrote was immediately after watching a short like news thing about Alicia Keys. Ooh. She, I guess, was also classically trained and played yeah. classical piano. Well, I would say, I mean, um, if you've seen her play, I mean, <laughs> she's quite good. Yeah, and it was like it was, she had just sort of started emerging, and she came out with the Fallen song and um, was doing her thing. And she was one of the first artists that I that I saw, female artist who was singing and playing piano at the same time. And so, ever since Alicia Keys started, I was like, oh, that girl is awesome. Wow. Um, and then they, I watched this little special thing on the news about how she would just like write songs. And I was like, I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> after I watched it, I like went upstairs and was at the keyboard. And I'm like, I'll write a song. And I did. And I liked it. <laughs> Wait, so how old are you? That's like in high school? Yeah, I think I'm in high school at this point. Wow. Like my junior year, sophomore year, something like that's that. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty early. I mean, that's, I mean, in. Yeah, and I was with, of course, Josh, your husband in the UK, and Alicia played there at the Queen's Jubilee. I know, he told me that. Dude, pretty Pretty amazing. Pretty Oh my gosh, so cool. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Uh, and he was like, you like Alicia Keys? I'm like, how could you not like Alicia Keys? There's something wrong with you. Alicia Keys is great. Oh my gosh, yeah. Well, but then we argued about her later music. But anyway, that's a different different conversation. But (laughs) Josh, I talked to Josh about it all. Early Alicia. (laughs) Early Alicia is unparalleled. Okay, she's okay. Back kind of slowly, but there's, there's I, a little lull there. I think so. Man, I, think, I think she's great. Yeah, yeah. No, I think she's great. I <laughs> argued Alicia. for her. I argued for her, just for what it's worth. Anyway, mm-hmm. but okay. Yeah. So, she so. Agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I think she'd agree with me. Okay, so, so, so you. No you, one, that song is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's not. I mean, awful. it's not awful. It's just it's she. Awful. She's awful. really, really good. Is the problem? So, like a normal song doesn't sound good. That's 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 what I would say. But mm-hmm. okay. So so now you're playing music. You're doing worship. You're like this geeky girl with all your geeky friends, nerdy friends, which I love. I just love. I just love. I love seeing like not very many of them. <laughs> girl i was kind of cool you know like i, I would like, say cool, ever like actually cool but you know <laughs> on the spectrum of like geeky i was like on the cooler end you know just, just i love for it. the record well because you're clear well, for the record well and you're a social person so you're probably connecting <laughs> yeah. with different kinds of people and yeah 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 okay so when is it that you start being like no this faith is my faith and mm. 
And I have like a call from God on my life. I know God is making me for something. Mm-hmm. Is that happening in high school? Does that start to happen in college? Okay. It's high school. It's high school. End of middle school to beginning of high school is where we made that switch of churches to a church mm-hmm. that had like a very robust youth group that was less less of just like, okay, kids hang out with each other while the adults have a thing and more right. of a, we are trying to form human beings mm. in a in a way uh, that is countercultural and different. And, and it was, so the youth group I, I went to was a very, very much like evangelical, but ended up becoming a mega church, essentially mega church by, you know, or my standards now in, even, in the South Bible Belt. So mm-hmm. culturally was very much in that world. Mm. And the youth group, was very strict actually they were pretty intense like you don't date you don't listen to secular music at one point wow. we went on a disney trip and they confiscated a mark anthony cd i tried to smuggle and i thought maybe it's in spanish they won't know that <laughs> it's about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so one of those you know like real hardcore right. and they expected anyone who's like in the youth group it's there's no like halfway you know you're like mm-hmm. all in radical for jesus yeah. um and so but there was the what what that ended up bringing about were this core of young people who were leaders in that context that they just they genuinely in their heart of hearts like deeply love Jesus and were like this has changed every aspect of my life mm-hmm. from how I relate to people from what I care about what I listen to what I watch like they were deeply shaped mm-hmm. by people who were in love with Jesus and that, and there was an intensity to how they pursued anything. Like we're going to lead worship. Now we're going to like gather together and pray and pray in tongues for like 30 minutes before we Mm. leave to like, make sure that like God is there. So there was no, there was no halfway in that context. And every young person was paired with a discipler who's like an adult who would meet with them regularly, Mm. hear about their lives, pray for them. So it was just, thorough and it was in that place there and they had classes on classes on classes and so it was like here's what the bible is here's what it means and so almost to a fault i think like they mm-hmm. made everything so accessible right so where there was this discipleship program called the purple book where we would go and like you read the bible and then there's like fill in the blank like this is what the holy spirit is blank like here's the bible verse read it the answer you know so mm-hmm. at that stage of my faith it was actually really helpful because mm-hmm. it's very like let's unpack things let's make things accessible and simple which was so different from this mystery inaccessible yeah. glory place of the pentecostal background that i came from and then as i approached college age you know it became less of a context that could hold my questions mm. you know it's like this is the fill in the blank bible study not the question the bible bible study mm. um, and it wasn't until transitioning from high school into college going into a place like yale which was wild yeah. um where people actually brought real questions yeah. and suspicion and wrestling to their faith. Um, so then that's where sort of Bible study went from fill in the blank to arguing with each other or like wrestling with the Bible, which, you know, wasn't necessarily allowed in the same way mm-hmm. in, the, in the church background that I had growing up. But it was in that sort of initial context that mm-hmm. the Bible which I knew, I always knew that I loved it, but it came alive in a different way for me. Yeah. And also was made like, it It made demands of me mm. in ways that were really good for me mm. um, and challenged some of my tendencies to, you know, just, oh, I like, you know, this is the default way I will be in the world. I will be a people pleaser. I'll be the person that everyone likes. Oh shoot, like, Jesus is alive. And it's like asking yeah. things of me and like wants friendship with me and that. Um, just was really transformative and beautiful in a place of like friendship with God and companionship that I hadn't felt like I didn't even know existed before. Hmm. Well, and I don't know if it's your experience. It, it's definitely mine that the amount of folks who's like life with God, I really respect and that's meaningful and authentic and caring and thoughtful A majority of those folks had some kind of window, usually in high school or college, where it was like radical, like burn your CDs, like memorize the Bible, slash share your faith, slash serve the poor or live with the poor and, you know, or spend part of your time homeless so you can identify with the poor. You know, like something that's just like, like, like 10 out of 10 radical. Yep. 
and I don't know, again, and then they usually have a moment where they're like, I don't know that this, I like the way you said that, this isn't a container that can hold all the questions that I have. You know, they start to realize this doesn't quite work entirely for me. But what's interesting about that is there's something about that window that helps make them radical types of people. Like they're, they're, and they're, and they're submitted. They know what it's like to just be like, you know, I can submit myself to things God is doing. But then they realize, well, wait a minute. I don't know that that's even what God was doing. So it isn't as though they lost the ability to be submitted and yielded to God, but but something about that window, whereas if people tend not to have a moment where they just say, you know what, I'm going to do whatever it takes to follow God. Often when they get older, they have a harder time just trusting that God will carry them through or being submitted when they don't like the way something's going. I don't, I don't know how else to say it, yeah. but but there's something about that little window that creates more of a self-sacrificial life. Mm. So it's interesting hearing your story, like, because it's funny. You think back, I mean, you know, I I was around, for, you know, same deal, like, you you know, different people, because I'd grown up listening to gangster rap. So, you know, I come to Christ, and it's like, you cannot listen to Snoop, man. You got to stop. I'm like, really? It's just so good. So all of a sudden, they're giving me all this, you know, I got, like, DC Talk and, like, you know, LOL. the grits the and all these folks. <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, but, but, but what's interesting is thinking back and just thinking, because of course it's my own mind. I, I know it decently well what's happening. I'm thinking, okay, that's fine. If that's what this costs, mm-hmm. that's what we're going to do. And, you know, if that means we're at the, you know, because people are doing 24 hour prayer meetings. So, like, we're going to do a 48 hour prayer meeting. You know, there's always this <laughs> sense that, like, we've got to do. <laughs> Like, we got to go for this thing. And yep. if it costs everything, that's fine. You know, we have, like, homeless people living in our ministry house. And, and they, you know, a few of us almost get stabbed a, a few times or, like, stuff just disappears from the house. You know, like, <laughs> oh, we don't have any lamps. That's weird. And but, <laughs> but at the same time, you're like, I look back. And it's not the kind of, you know, now I have kids, I'd be like, oh, don't do that. That's dangerous or whatever. Mm -hmm. But there's something about that window that shaped me in a way that then later I could say, ah, I know what it is to give my whole life to this. And this isn't about whether I'm willing to go to the wall. It's about something else. It's about other things like what is more comprehensive? What is more robust? Mm -hmm. So in the same window, I'm curious, just because I know your story, where is it that you start? I mean, of course, maybe from your family story, but where is it you start to realize what's going on with immigration and justice? And how how do those things start to enter into your framework? Because it doesn't sound like this youth group is necessarily that kind of youth group. Correct. Correct. (laughs) I mean, maybe some. When do those things start? clicking well i think that there's a couple of things that threads in my life that i think come together later on but on the one hand i think i've always been aware of sort of these broader social dynamics of difference and belonging and quite frankly racism uh just growing up in the south where some of those things are just so overt. I mean, I grew Mm. up going to a, by the time I was in high school, I went to middle school and high school, I went to a private school that was overwhelmingly white kids Mm. with money. Mm. And as one of the very few brown kids at that school, just the things that you see and hear, it makes you awake to that everywhere you go. So, I mean, this is just, it's like, the South and the that 90s and 2000s, you know, like there's a lot, a lot of the kids have like Confederate flag posters in their locker and are oh, like wow. at lunch talking about how they would, you know, why is it that all the black kids are together and that's segregation and they would never be with anybody like dark or like, oh, you're 
family must have all come in a raft because they're from Puerto Rico, even though you're born U.S. citizen, like all sorts of stuff all the time. And as somebody who didn't look like the vast majority of everyone around me every day at school, but mm. also gravitate towards other kids who were similarly different. Right. Um, and then just hearing about their experiences, their stories of feeling on the margins and being treated as such. And um, yeah, and so uh, one of my, my closest friend in high school was half black, half white. Um, and then just spending time with her, occupying that world. And then the church I grew up in was mostly Latino. Um, mm -hmm. And so spending time with friends from there and occupying their world. And then like my school is mostly white. And then my church is kind of multi-ethnic at that point, but never talks about it. And so it was, it's something that from being, since being young, I've just always been aware of the different contexts that people are coming from and the painful, often painful dynamics that happen when they come together. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, being having the privilege of being able to travel a bunch with my mom and see other places um, mm -hmm. of the world and how vastly different they are. And so that and and then reading all of the times, so like reading so much about people from far away, you know, and mm -hmm. and so even even at a young age, I think I've been I was curious about the experiences of people who felt like they didn't quite belong in a place. Right. Because I knew what that felt like. And also because I just knew that there was so much, they just felt like there was so much weight behind that. And so I've always been curious about that and attentive to that. And it's, in, I mean, it's my family story. Obviously my, my parents, though, they're not immigrants in terms of immigration status, they are immigrants culturally. And so right. have, seeing them navigate, you know, these spaces of where they're often the only ones who look like them and then mm -hmm. the, the the different sort of morphing that has to happen to succeed mm -hmm. in that. So I've always been attentive to that, but that sort of been like a curiosity that had been not integrated with what it meant to be a person of faith because I was in a church context that didn't really address that or talk about that. Yeah. They modeled it in some ways in terms of like the unity, like our music was always like you know, diverse backgrounds. It's like mm. they're miles ahead of a lot of places in terms of their actual expression of multi ethnicity, right. but they never intentionally engaged some of that like historical oppressive type underbelly of that. Yeah. And so that always left it left it as like a, you know, that's not something that the faith that, that my faith can illuminate. Yeah. Um so it really wasn't until college that um in, in that sort of different faith context where you're able to ask questions of the Bible and apply those questions to like questions of society mm. and I started taking classes on like ethnicity and race. And I was an ethnicity, race and migration major at Yale. So like a bunch of classes about what it means to be. So wait, wait, wait. So that that's your, why would you declare that major? I mean, what, what made you go? That's. It was an awesome major. <laughs> no, no, so no. I, <laughs> but as I know, as I wait, knew wait. it was a possible no. major, I'm like, I'm definitely majoring in this. But, but, this is but, fascinating. But when I'm listening to your story, you're going, yeah, this is something I'm aware of, I'm thinking mm -hmm. about. But it wasn't necessarily like, oh, this is like what I'm about. Like, this is something I talk about and think. But it's when you come to college, all of a sudden it like shows itself, so to speak, like. Man, it's this is what I think about. So like it had been okay. throughout high school, like something that I've been mm. contemplating, chewing on. Like one, it's not like I'm reading treatises on anything. You know, right. I didn't know that, that there were resources of people who were thinking critically about that sort of thing. Interesting. You know, it's just like, this is just the way it is. Like people are racist and you have to like figure it out. Mm. Or like, you know, people who are brown in predominantly white spaces are often like, you know, smushed and, and feel a certain kind of way. And that's just the way it is. And like, you know, cultures don't really know how to I deal with one another and isn't that interesting but in college even just the first semester of my freshman year i think i took a class called like race and ethnicity <laughs> and it was just about like american history and identity and how some of those things congeal and different ways of, of expressing that and mm. it was just really it was eye-opening because i'm like oh wow yeah i i was thinking about this stuff but i just didn't know that there's like academic books about it and you yeah. can be thoughtful about it. And there's this thing called like sociology about how humans interact. And there's, there's patterns there that you can learn from. And, um, mm. it was just fascinating to me. So mm. yeah, from, from the jump, I was like, this is very interesting, but That's at the so time cool. ethnicity, race and migration was only a second major. Like you couldn't major in it only. 
Right. So my other major was political science, about which I learned surprisingly little. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting. So it's it's like something that you probably the academic space reveals to you. Oh, I have been thinking about this. I just didn't know there was a world by which I could learn more about this. Right. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay. So you go to Yale, which means you did pretty well in high school. I would Apparently. Assume. Yeah. <laughs> Which so, is funny because I don't I don't think I had tons of extracurriculars. Like I feel like the typical person who goes to Yale is like president of the debate oh, club, right. chess club, and every other club. And I was just like, I kind of just went to church. And like I did theater, but I never had a role that like spoke words. Like I wasn't particularly <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> I mean, funny. I did my competitive piano playing, but like I was always, to be honest, among the other people I played piano with, like among the more mediocre because I didn't practice enough. And so it was a total shocker to me, to be honest. <laughs> that you got in, which is a big deal. That I got into Yale. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah, that's cool. So then, and so then describe in college, so now you're taking, you know, classes that are opening your mind to like oh, some of these dynamics. Mm -hmm. How did you, I, I don't think I actually know the story. How did you then end up bumping into the vineyard? How did that start mm -hmm. to take hold? So fun fact, the Pentecostal Spanish church I went to for a while rented from a vineyard church in Jacksonville. So oh. for a while, I went to a church that had the big sign about the vineyard. And we sang a bunch of vineyard songs in Spanish and English, like the oh. old ones. The more love, more power, and this yeah. is the air I breathe, and all yeah. that stuff. I didn't know it was vineyard, but it totally was. But it wasn't until college. Again, my freshman year, I went to this church that a lot of my friends in the Christian fellowships went to, because I went to Christian fellowship, right? Mm -hmm. It was just like a very Christian, formed in that, you know, youth group space. It was like, it was like, I'm going to be involved in church things. Yeah, it's not like totally. Either. And I went to this Baptist church for a while that was like very, like almost academic in its mm. teaching. This is a British pastor at the time. And so he like, sat, you know how like British, <laughs> stereotypically British people like totally. sound yeah. smarter. Yes. And so, the, but the sermons actually were kind of like intellectual, like mm. you're thinking, like, I guess like Tim Keller-esque, like that kind of like, yeah, yeah. Kind of Bible. And so I enjoyed that and enjoyed the fact that a lot of my friends went there, but the singing part was like, you stand and you hold the hymnal and like, yeah. there's not even like a band and everyone's singing just like clearly just reading and i'm just like this is not what i'm used to right i'm used to the music being a place of like uh you're feeling things and you're talking to god and that friendship like music as a friendship space yeah music in that church was not a friendship space it was a, like this is where we sing space yeah and their hymns you know they're like uh three degrees removed from like singing to god and so it just wasn't it it didn't feel like that was a huge part for me of what what I loved about church. And so right. it felt weird. And then one of my friends from the Christian Fellowship was like, you should come to my church. They sing a lot. And so then I rode with them to the New Haven Vineyard um, where they did sing a lot. It was a lot mm. of singing. Um, and Caleb Maskell was on the worship team then there and Matt Crosman, who like ended up planting our church out of mm -hmm. that church. And so there was just so much worship. Um, and it was in that context that... Uh, that it was, it, it felt like a kind of coming home, but in a very new way, mm -hmm. because there, there was this extended spaciousness and this friendship in worship. Um, even though musically, like culturally, musically, the worship wasn't what I was familiar with mm -hmm. in the same way, like from the church that I really came mm -hmm. to faith in, because that really was a more like intentionally multi ethnic, especially more jubilant, you know. So this is more of the like acoustic guitar led songs, but. It was this, it was so clearly that familiar place of music as expression of friendship to God and with God. And also this spaciousness for mysterious encounter that felt familiar to my church back home. Yeah. But it was the first time that there was that like spiritual, supernatural type of like expectation that God would show up in mm. weird ways. You know, like somebody mm -hmm. stands up and yells at the scripture and I am the Lord. And like there's like a tongue somewhere. So the vineyard is the first place that I actually heard in a church service, a tongue spoken out loud mm -hmm. and an interpretation, mm -hmm. which feels like representative of what the vineyard was represented for me, mm -hmm. where there was this tongue, this expression of intimacy with God in community with others 
But there was also an interpretation, which made mm. that space of intimacy accessible for yeah. regular people, not just like the special holy people who could just, you know, it's incredible. dive right in. And it's weird, but it's weird in a way that <laughs> you're attracted to somehow. <laughs> it's, just, but you, it's an attractive weird. Yeah, but part of it's you have your other background. You have the two extremes and you're starting to see something that's in the middle, which mm -hmm. is pretty cool. And so then you are in that vineyard church and then you kind of take some of your other learning and you decide I'm going into law. <laughs> Not quite that quickly, but yes. Yeah, so, well, t tell me about that. How, how did you the start to go? It was, was a bit messy. So hmm. I think it's my freshman year. I take a class and I'm still figuring out what I want to do with my life. Right. I'm like, mm -hmm. I know I like people. I know I've always been drawn to the experience of people who feel like they're on the outer edges of a space, mm -hmm. um, on the outer edges of belonging and like people who are, who are oppressed, who are not experiencing fullness of freedom, just because mm. I've been hyper aware as like someone who feels that gap in belonging as like often the only brown person in a room, mm. but also is very well aware of the different privileges that the successful American dream story of my family has allowed me to enjoy yeah. that are not enjoyed by very, very, very many other people. Yeah. So I've just been hyper aware of that tension all the time. Um, so I've been drawn to to those communities. I'm like, I want to maybe I'll do like, I don't know, social work or like, mm -hmm. should I be a pastor? I really love Jesus. Like, should I go be a missionary? You know, thinking of all these different career paths mm. for me, none of which are like well compensated, which is a little bit distressing to my parents. <laughs> um, yeah, the doctors, and... the doctors are like social worker. Yeah. <laughs> what? What? Every semester, missionary. Well, chemistry. Keep your options open. That was <laughs> take like, chemistry. Ooh, That's so good. Keep your options open, Tina. Maybe I love you can it. help more people making tons of money please. yeah I love um it. so and it, I, law wasn't even on the table right like mm. there's some people who are like i want to be a lawyer ever since i was little no because I, I always thought of lawyers as just like they're really argumentative they talk to poor people they fight in court i'm a very agreeable yeah. person usually <laughs> in an argument someone makes an argument i'm like wow i see that i agree with you actually like i'm not I'm like, historically i'm not like stood my ground right, with arguments right and so i'm just like no law why would that be for me but i took a human rights law class about like oppression around the world and i'm like mm. wait human rights those are all lawyers like that's all law so just the field of law as like a compassionate like justice type of thing mm. for, for whatever reason just wasn't it wasn't on the table for me until i realized that those are hmm, maybe law maybe that hmm. mm. so it's just the thought in the back of my mind but there was no passion or actual personal draw being drawn toward it until um i had this experience the summer after my sophomore year of college where i did like a it was a christian ministry thing yeah, I found out about them through Urbana, the inner inner varsity missions yeah. conference, where it was like go around the world and uh, talk about Jesus. So there's this group called Interchange, and they do, I guess, um, like it was in the era where like the new monastic thing was coming up, where like mm -hmm. all the you know privileged kids go move to the hood and live there and like mm -hmm. learn about Jesus or whatever. And so they i think do that but it's not just like let's go live there like you know it's it's ministry in an incarnational context mm. in urban centers around the u.s and the world so they had this summer program called like a, i think it's called summer exchange with the letter x and i did it in um san francisco with this uh ministry that primarily reaches out to kids who aren't in gangs mm. and um the guy who runs the program was abroad in Guatemala at the time. And the one who was in charge every day of everything is an immigrant from El Salvador who mm. pretty much changed my life. Um, he, and, and so he ran this ministry and the ministry is twofold. One was hanging out with gang members who I thought they were like in the advertising, it's like kids, but they were definitely like my age, like older teenagers, like men who are wow. in gangs. Wow. Um, yeah, that's, that's different. So my right. mom saw the pictures and she's like, um, <laughs> she's like me hanging out with people covered in tattoos. Right. Uh, and so there's like Bible studies, basically. There's like the Norteños and the Sureños and two different gangs that were like active mm. in the mission district in San Francisco at the time before it was super duper duper gentrified. And so they're different days because they can't hang out, obviously. Right. And we would, you know, study the Bible with these Latino, all Latino gang members, teenagers, and just do Bible study and like field trips and stuff. And wow. then the other piece was we would go visit the kids in juvenile detention who could not speak English and had no one to visit them. Mm. So, and the, the, the vast majority of volunteers who helped in this ministry were undocumented immigrants from Central America. 
And one of my tasks that summer was to teach English to this woman from El Salvador who herself also was undocumented. And these were people who loved Jesus passionately. And mm -hmm. the one who ran the program is Catholic and actually came to faith essentially in the liberation theology based communities context mm -hmm. in El Salvador, knew Oscar Romero before he was assassinated. Like, wow. Just these stories upon stories of just like mind blowing experiences. So I was hearing stories on all fronts from the gang member kids, mm. many of whom were immigrants themselves. One of the kids actually came across the border and like ended up here during the program and was just like talking about what he had seen, you know, crossing the border. And I just, I had no idea. I had no idea. So they're giving me the tour of San Francisco and the, the people who are running the program were just like, oh yeah, there's a place where the people stand all day, kind of like hoping to get picked up to like do a job, any sort of job, because yeah. they don't have any work papers. And so you just you do what you can. And then the person I'm teaching English is telling me stories about how, yeah, I had an ear infection the other day, like recently and I couldn't go anywhere because I don't have health care and there's no health care for me because I'm undocumented. So I go to the, I would go to the ER, but it's so expensive. And so you just kind of like struggle and you can't do anything, you know, right. um, to the guy who ran the program and is telling me stories of fleeing civil war. And there is no recognition of his status as an asylee, right? Seeking refuge because the yeah. war was sort of this political thing that the U.S. was kind of backing. And so, and, and so his experiences of like trying and trying and trying to trying to enter the United States over and mm. over and over. And then just the experience of being an immigrant here, just hearing all these stories. And then the, the most, mm. the thing that got me the most was the kids who were in detention. Yeah. They had all crossed as like unaccompanied minors, basically, and mm. describing what the madness of that journey and riding on top of trains, you know, and seeing people get killed. Most of, every single one of them had seen people die as like a 13 to 15 year old boy. Yeah, that's just life. It's just, right. it's just madness. And then they get here and there's nothing they can do. And all their context is like drugs and and, and money and, and war, basically like this gang stuff. And then they go in and out of juvie. And then they still will say at the end of the day, I'm glad. I'm glad I would have done it. I wouldn't have done it differently because my mom back home in Honduras lives in rural Honduras and has nothing. And my brother has this medical condition. She can't pay for anything. And so mm. like we're able to there's nothing there. And so that's why I still would do it the same way. It's just, wow. it was pretty mind blowing. Just that's the whole summer. You do that the whole that's summer. A, that was the summer. That was the summer. Wow. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's what did it for me at the end of the day, ultimately is what made me be like, wait a minute, lawyer laws have defined what is possible hmm. for these people. Every single yeah. one of them, like the law that says like, you can't come here. The law that says once you're here, you can't access this, that, the other. Right. Uh, the law that says, you know, like you've done this and this is the consequence. Like you've been involved in this. Therefore, you are in a detention facility, like alone as a kid. And this is what that means for you. Yeah. All of these laws have defined what is possible. Mm. And the vast majority of them had no lawyer and helping them navigate it. Right. I've never spoken to an immigration lawyer about their possibilities, you know, um, or they had appointed lawyers in court. And I, we would go to court hearings and I would see how those lawyers did. Mm, it was bad. Yeah. Just the quality of representation was just like so low that, that, you know, seeing someone do something badly or seeing someone not have access to something is can sometimes make you be like, well, I could do that. No, I think seeing the lawyers, I think it was actually seeing the lawyer in court do the criminal stuff like really badly. Mm. Like, you know what? I could do that. But also even just like how these, these folks needed an, like a, an advocate and like mm. a guide through a system yeah. that literally made no sense to them. Yes. Um, and so it sort of piqued my curiosity about, hmm, I wonder if, if I could, if I could study this. summer and fall, our Vineyard USA associations are gathering all over the country. Associations are groups of historically underrepresented Vineyard USA pastors and leaders, and we currently have four associations. The Hispanic Association, the Black Pastors and Leaders Association, the Asian American Pacific Islander Association, and the Women's Association. If you're a part of one of these historically underrepresented groups, are currently engaged in ministry, or interested in learning more about ministry to these groups, we'd encourage you to come to one of these gatherings. So check out VineyardUSA.com 
www.thepeopleshow.org slash associations for more information. Every month, we introduce a new book or recommended resource to dig in deeper. For August, our team has curated a few articles about justice for you to read. And at the end of this month, we'll have an episode diving in deeper to some of the concepts from these articles. You won't want to miss it. Check out vineyardusa.org slash podcast to download these articles and see all of the resources from our team. That's so cool. Well, and it, and it matches again. So the first thing I said is I, about everyone I know I respect has had some kind of radical window of their faith journey. And then second, almost everyone that I've seen real growth and health in their life, they've had some kind of immersive experience too. So mm, sometimes it's shorter, you know, maybe it might be a missions trip or a series of missions trips or maybe even something inside of their own city like they serve with refugees or they are at the shelter downtown or wherever. But that immersive experience that just totally takes you out of your context. Now there's like a whole nother world yeah. I've learned about that. Yeah. Now it kind of reorients what I think my life is for. You know, it's not just the the track I was on for uninterrupted success, but how, how does that work serve other people? like this, the people that I've gotten my heart around. That's really powerful. Right. Okay. So that's when you start going, maybe I could do law. I, I could do that. Meanwhile, you're at the vineyard, you're finishing at Yale. And then where did you go to law school? You, you didn't go to University of Connecticut. That's right. The University mm -hmm. of Connecticut. I was like, I knew it was somewhere else on the East coast. You and do you, do you specialize in a, in certain kind of law? No, it's just Nope. <laughs> yeah, law, law school, they're just like, here, learn a little bit of everything. Yes. Take this exam that's literally about everything and then immediately forget everything you just took an exam on. <laughs> now go practice law knowing literally nothing. <laughs> and did you start right into immigration law or did you start doing other kinds of law? Mm, other kinds. So, so my law school, law school though the curiosity about law school was sort of made concrete that summer after my sophomore year, mm -hmm. I didn't, I wasn't sure about it. Okay. So I actually applied to law school my senior year, was going to go straight, was going to go to NYU in New York City. Mm -hmm. Then I was like, is this really, is this really what I, am I picking law because it's a way to help people and be important and like make mm -hmm. my parents happy? Mm -hmm. Or is it because it's, it's what the Lord is calling me into. Mm. Also, is it just law because, you know, this is the most urgent need and I can do that? Or is, is there other aspects of my life that, that Jesus is inviting me to, whether it's music or ministry? Like, have I even given space to explore those? Mm. So I decided to defer for a year and spent half a year in Argentina doing another mm. immersive thing with like homeless teenagers in wow. Buenos Aires. Wow. And then and then came back for a little while. I was dating Josh at the time. And I was like, okay, let me spend some time with my boyfriend before I leave to go to New York and do my own thing. And then that's where I felt like, uh, you know, pretty strongly that this is not the move for right now. This is not the time for right now. And mm. unenrolled in law school, had a floppy year of like, what am I doing with my life? Right. Worked at a bagel shop for a little while, <laughs> taught some piano to some children, <laughs> became the worship pastor of the Elm City Vineyard Church. Hey, there you go. Um, and then married Joshua Williams and then reapplied to law school after doing another, like this experience working with refugees in New Haven mm. um, in the legal context. And so then applied only in Connecticut and went to UConn. So by that point, it by the time I started UConn, I had a sense that I wanted to do immigration, like for real, mm -hmm. um, not just like whatever. But I also had the sense that I was like, I might go to law school and not practice law. I don't yeah, I want to go to law school and be open to using the degree for whatever. And sure. so I went by the time I started, it was like hard fought to get there. Right. Because I was like, right. I went, I was like, rolled and I unrolled and I deferred, you know. And so by the time I started UConn, I was like, I'm going to learn as much as I possibly can. Mm. about what it means, to, how the system works and what it means to be an advocate. And I will apply it, maybe not as a lawyer. Mm. So with that approach, uh, there were like immigration clinics. I actually didn't do those clinics. I did like a children's advocacy clinic and I mm. did like a nonprofit law clinic. And I um, lived in New Haven and, and was on staff at the church as a worship pastor during law school. And so I like, I felt like I had one foot in law school and one mm -hmm. foot like deeply rooted in my local community in New Haven. Mm. 
And I'm like, I'm going to take what I can get from law school, but it's not like I'm going for like my boot camp in immigration law necessarily. Yeah. I just knew I wanted to work with this community in some form or fashion and the law would, would make sense as a path, but who knows? Right. So determined to not follow the traditional, you know, law school funnel, career funnel, I ended up graduating law school and immediately working at a corporate law firm, um, which is like the law school dream. Right. And then it wasn't until after that, that I um, did a deep dive into like defensive deportation defense. And so you go, radiation. you go for what, you know, I mean, the dark way of saying is like, you're going for the dream corporate job and you realize, <laughs> what am I doing? This is not me. Oh, no, it wasn't like that at all, actually. No. The the How I ended up with the career path that I ended up in was like completely left field and wild. Mm. Um, and I ended up in these places that so many people are like fighting for mm -hmm. by total happenstance. Mm. So I ended up at the, the corporate job when there's this thing called OCI, on-campus interviews, where these you know, cushy law firms, like they swarm the law school. Everybody's dressed in a suit and tie yeah, and like their yeah. professional best to do these interviews on campus to try to get the coveted spots, the summer associateship, right. these summer internships yeah. that if you do well enough, you might get a job for real, for real when you graduate. And it was a kind of economic crisis moment when I was in law school. So people were really competing for these. And I was at the first summer of law school, I was interning at a law clinic that I did do an immigration clinic at Yale for the summer. And then all my coworkers were like, are you doing OCI? Are you doing OCI? And I was like, what is it? When does it expire? And they're like, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have to apply online. And most people apply for like 12, 15, you know, a bunch of places to try to get as many as you can. And I was at a church thing, an artist circle where we're like writing songs, you know, doing this like thing that I facilitated as my church mm -hmm. job. And it, it's over and it's like 1145. And I'm like, let me look at this OCI thing. And there was only one company that you could apply for that didn't require a cover letter that was in new haven and i was like okay so i submitted my resume which i didn't edit at all so it's like i you know like did this missions thing and i like do ministry and it had nothing to do with my credentials as a right, lawyer really right. and like, i sing sometimes you know um and i submitted my resume didn't think much of it and that was my one interview that i got and then they were like you were so interesting <laughs> and then um <laughs> i ended up being interviewed for the summer associateship. I got the summer associateship. Once I got the summer associateship, I actually had an opportunity to spend a month in Uganda. And then in another move wow. of like career suicide, I was like, Is, I know I just got this job, but can I take like a month of this two month thing off to go to Uganda? And they were like, okay. So I did my one month of incredibly well-paid work as a summer associate yeah. and then like went to Uganda for a month. And I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, they're probably not going to hire me back. Cause I'm like, right not demonstrating a vigorous fight to be here. Um, and then they were like, we really like you. We want you to come back. Will you work here? Mm. And that was the only job I applied to. Like I didn't, I, I mean, I applied to some other things, but we were discerning, should we leave New Haven? Should we plant a church in New York? Where even are we going to be? And then it just right. ended up, I ended up working there. So it really wasn't a like, Ooh, I want this now. It was right. just like, I want all these other things. I'm very open to not getting this. Oh shoot. Here's, I got here's this. a job. Wow. I got this. And so I worked for two years in a very high level, like world. It, it just, mm. I wasn't steeped in this world voluntarily. Like I hadn't opted into this world really. Like it, it felt kind of familiar, familiar to some of the stuff back home, like mm -hmm. growing up, you know, the, the fancy doctor world that I right. sort of dabbled with my parents, but it wasn't ever my like chosen path. And so being there was pretty interesting all the mm. fancy dinners and all the like, sure. like yeah. the, the, they wine and dine you as a, even a, in the summer, like go sailing on the yacht. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, that's like your job. What? Right. So it's just, it's just wild, you know, like night and day from the summer in San Francisco. But then so, you're yeah, like, so I did that for a while, but, but then you end up at like doing what you do now. So how, how do you get from, <laughs> sailing on a yacht to, <laughs> to and, well, and describe a little bit <laughs> about what you do cut. now. Talk a little bit about the law you do now. Like what, what, what kinds of cases are you looking at? What kinds of people are you representing? And then maybe give a bridge. Like, how do so... I go from the yacht to this? <laughs> because it's a, it's not like, it's not clear. It's not the typical next step. No, it is um, not. Yeah. So I think I, I can describe what I do as humanitarian immigration law. Mm -hmm. And that is because 
the way I describe it to my clients, it's like, there's only so many buckets that allow you to be here lawfully. Mm -hmm. And it's either money and and degrees, which is like Mm -hmm. the work visa world. It's connections, which is the family visa world, or it's trauma, which is the only bucket that allows you to get a green card eventually if you snuck in, in a nutshell. Um, And so the trauma bucket is what we work with because we, I work primarily with people who snuck in, people who crossed the border illegally, were apprehended by immigration or put into removal proceedings. They are actively being deported from the United States and they need to present something as a defense. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of like a lawyer on the front lines of defending people from deportation, Mm -hmm. or maybe it's people who already got ordered removed and they are, didn't leave. And so they're still here and they can't go back because really bad things are waiting for them. And so what can they possibly do? So we fight and we try to reopen the old removal order. So I'm the, I, I do sort of the motions to reopen all the re- removal orders. I do the defense against removal. Mm-hmm. And I also represent people who maybe they didn't sneak in. Maybe they came on a student visa or like a tourist visa, but they're like, I'm not going back because I can't. Yeah. And so then I'll do the asylum applications, the affirmative asylum applications, mm. as we call them when they're not in immigration court as a defense, but like affirmatively, please give me asylum. And, and how most do you of see, my clients, go ahead. How do you see your faith informing that? Because everywhere. Yes. Yeah, so say I would assume that because I know you. And and I know you everywhere. still lead worship at your church and you write worship songs. I mean, so like obviously, but but tell me about how, how does your faith inform that work that you do? Well, I think that I've been thinking lately about um, how funny it is that I feel like I occupy these different worlds, right? This church world, um, which can mm-hmm. often primarily be concerned with like church dynamics internal to itself, but it's also, you know, about loving the world and, and giving a space for people who are hurting. And then there's like immigration law world where you're grappling with these systems and structures and trying to navigate them and how sometimes they can feel like separate, but Mm -hmm. it feels very integrated to me. Um, It feels like what I'm doing at work is honestly like, it feels like I'm in the trenches of, of, of our broken world and seeing and bearing witness to stories because to put these applications together, it requires stories. It requires sitting Mm -hmm. down with somebody who has suffered profound trauma and drawing out of them their story of what happened to them and writing it down in their Mm. own words, reading it back to them, you know, and then presenting it in a way that a very distant, very powerful man usually will understand and maybe think applies to the law. Um, Or maybe like, you know, convince them that that there's a legal pathway for them based on that story. So this bearing witness role feels like very much sacred work Mm. and holy work Mm. to bear witness to the lived experiences of people. And in their stories, I see so much of Jesus' story, right? Mm. I think like as an immigration lawyer, I definitely see even applying immigration law to Jesus' life, he would have qualified for asylum. Yeah. <laughs> he was uh, fleeing a well-founded fear of future persecution on account of a protected ground and that he was a Hebrew boy, like targeted for massacre by the king mm. and then fled to Egypt, right? He would have been, an, he was an asylum seeker essentially. Yeah under U.S. law, yeah. and he did suffer violence under an oppressive government. And so I'm sitting with my Nicaraguan clients who are talking about, you know, the government of my country right now is saying, you better support this or die. Mm. And I'm saying, I refuse because I have a conviction of something else. Like, these are heroes, you know, like mm. these are these are people who, whether or not they know it, they are following in the way of Christ in their resistance to oppression or, and, or following in the footsteps of of Christ in fleeing Mm. persecution. Mm. And so in that sense, I see my faith at work because I feel like my clients are walking closer to the footsteps of Christ than I'm typically able to see in the like, you know, upwardly mobile, comfortable, like Western church Mm. context. So there's that. And so in that sense, I feel like I am literally serving Christ in the way that like you're giving someone a cup of water, you're giving it to me, like Jesus yeah. says. And it also feels like faith in action, like gospel work. And then, I don't know, as, as I do my immigration work, I think about so much of the American rhetoric around immigration is around like following the rules and being deserving. Yeah, say, say more about that, because obviously this is in the news. This is a political conversation. 
Turns mm-hmm. out we've had a few elections that have been exciting, but, but and, we'll, and we'll have more. And this obviously always hits one of the talking points. And so you're working with people. What 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 do you think that most people are unaware of or specifically Christians that might be unaware of? Of what's really the story behind the story, because like what you're saying, you're hearing stories. You're not just dealing with policies or you're right. hearing stories so of stories. people. Yeah. So what, what are people yeah. like not seeing? Oh, I got plenty to say about this. So <laughs> there's a lot that you wouldn't know based on how people talk about stuff in the news. Mm-hmm. You would just. It's just so fundamentally detached from reality. Mm -hmm. One thing that is fundamentally detached from reality that you hear people talk about is like, oh, but these people, they're not coming the right way. So what they need to do is get in line, right? Get in Mm -hmm. line and come the right way. If they come the right way, we'll treat them with dignity and respect and allow them to stay. But the reason they need to be kicked out of the country is because they didn't follow the rules. So go back and follow the rules, right? Mm -hmm. I think we've all heard that spoken somewhere from some official person. But what is detached from reality in that is that the rules are not complete Mm -hmm. and are broken such that there are no rules that massive amounts of people can even follow. So there is no line is the thing. Mm -hmm. So people think that there's this like magical line where you, if you follow the rules and do things the right way, you can get into the country Mm. and be allowed to stay. But that's actually inaccurate because remember the buckets I talked about, there's Mm -hmm. the like, you have money and connections, maybe there's a line for you. But if you don't have money or connections, there is literally no line. Mm. Now you can say, oh, you can apply for asylum at the border. But I think we saw in the madness of, of some of the earlier years of the prior administration, there wasn't a lot. There literally wasn't a line, right? You can right. stand there in like these massive camps and no one will let you apply for asylum. So that whole get get in line and do things the right way is inaccurate because for those who are poor and hurting, mm-hmm. there is no right way to come. Yes. So that's an important just fact to put out there because people are not sneaking in because they don't like following the rules it's because there are no rules that they're allowed to follow. Yeah. They're blocked at the, at the, at the gate. You cannot mm. even apply for this thing unless you have X, Y, Z. So I think that's a huge one that there is no line. Um, and then I think another huge one misconception is that there are all these loopholes in the system, right? Mm. Like there's loopholes in the asylum system that people are exploiting. Mm-hmm. Right. I think we've definitely heard people talk about that, how people mm-hmm. are, taking advantage of our generous laws to just get in here and work and make money, right? Mm -hmm. But as a a practitioner in primarily the asylum system, what is very, very true is that there are so few loopholes and it's like, there are no holes, they're just borders. Like there's just walls. Um, Mm. And they've only gotten thicker and bigger uh, in the past several years. Mm. So... What, what I end up seeing more often than someone sneaking through with asylum who is undeserving of asylum is people being denied asylum and sent back to their countries where they are then brutalized because mm-hmm. of the violence waiting for them there. Yep. Because the asylum rules are so technically difficult to satisfy. It's not enough to show that someone will probably kill you. But you have to show that someone will probably kill you for the right reasons. So why do they want to kill you? Is it because of your identity or just because they're bad guys? Because if it's just because they're bad guys, you don't get asylum, right? So, I mean, I've heard, I've sat with someone who was telling a horrible, horrible story that is 100% true and not fabricated in any way, shape, or form as he is weeping, describing Mm. how the MS-13 showed up at his place of work after they were like, work for us. And he said, no. And they murder everyone close to him, just massacre them. Mm. And then he comes and he tells this story and is mocked by the ICE attorney who is fighting against him. Because another not fun fact about the system is that it's humanitarian law, but it's an adversarial system. So there's someone against you as you're trying to apply for this benefit that legally maybe should be. So he suffered this. He really is very much at risk. They've already said, we're going to kill you if you go back. And then he's denied because can you really prove that it was for a protected reason that they did that? Right. Yeah. So that's more what I see in the asylum system. Fear is real. Danger is real, but you can't prove it or you can't read the minds of your persecutors sufficiently to 
prove well, why. And how, yeah, how do you prove that? Yeah, like this is why they did this. Yeah, that's very. I mean, they're not going to testify. That's what that would like. Like, <laughs> like they're not going to say, yeah, that is. Definitely not going to. Yeah, that's why we did this. Yeah. The wow. ICE attorney in that case actually literal quote was like, well, he didn't go in saying snitches get stitches. So how do we really know? Like, wow. <laughs> This is Honduras. Anyway, um, Oof, that's rough. so so it's it's a harsh it's a harsh 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 system. And mm. in, honestly, just think of like at a human level, what kind of context are we inviting people to tell their most tender stories? Yeah, it's in an adversarial system. So to people who do not know their background, who do not understand their story, really. Yeah. Um, through the translator of an, an immigration attorney who like a lot of them aren't good lawyers. They like, it's so easy to steal money from immigrants. They got no other recourse. They're not going to agree with you. They don't speak your language. Right. Yeah. So the, the level of harshness in the immigration system as it currently exists is also something I think that's not understood by the general public mm. because you're asking survivors of trauma to talk about the most horrible things in a context that does not have space for compassion for yeah. their stories. And yeah. I'll be honest, it's not everybody. It's not everybody that is fleeing the most horrific violence ever. Right. Um, sometimes it's like not as serious, but it's still worse than like what, you know, it's it's still this deep feeling of hopelessness and I have no other choice. Yeah. Um, and so that, that lack of compassion in our immigration enforcement, particularly the enforcement branch mm -hmm. ICE, in like the courts, um, it is not, it doesn't leave much room for compassion or tenderness for people's humanity. So that's, I think, another space to your early question of where I see my faith at work is that I'm able to be like, um, a presence of witness that is demonstrably like leaving room for compassion and like dignity in a system mm. that doesn't honor that very well. Mm. And so, Tina, if somebody was thinking like, man, I want to. I want to be helpful. I see all of these issues like, you know, maybe you live near a border town or, you know, even in your own city. You know, these immigration stories are in every city in America. You know, you, you know, people are thinking, oh, that's that's down near El Paso or El Centro or that that's that's something that people are dealing with, you know, down there. But the truth is, this is every single city, every city in America. There's folks who are sometimes fleeing horrible things they're trying to find work they're they're you know in cities all all over america what would you say to people who are like i want to be helpful man i hear this story you're describing tina i don't know what to do i'm not a lawyer maybe i'm a pastor what's helpful what what puts them as part of the solution any ministry i think that shows kindness is mm. helpful for folks who are fleeing their home country and navigating a hostile land. Mm. Um, I think often, and I don't work in a Christian law firm, so mm -hmm. it's not a context where we're sort of like free to, and now let's do prayer ministry, you know, but right. everything within me wants to sometimes so just like, you know what folks need is like, a kind, just kindness, like a kind mm. and compassionate person to like lay a hand on their shoulder and bless them and give them a prophetic word and minister. Like the power of what we do, just we just by default, we leaks out of us as the vineyard. Yeah. It would be such a healing balm for the community that I represent because to be an immigrant in America is a lot of hard things, mm -hmm. especially when you're not coming at the invitation of America. Yeah. Like it is ceaseless work. It's hustle. Like my clients hustle so hard. They work so hard, so hard. And so that idea of like the freedom and blessing to like rest and receive, that's not something you don't receive, right? Mm. There's no handouts for mm. immigrants. And so it's a hustle constantly. So being able to receive a ministry of blessing of any sort, clothing, food, prayer, you know, mm. is, is rare and a gift in kingdom work, I think. Um, I think it's also like, it, like I said, it's harsh, right? So a, a compassionate ministry is something that would be a huge gift. Mm. It's, it's also full of lies. <laughs> like the whole American dream notion is, is I think sometimes it's like a, 
a lie, like an evil message, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. like, oh, like if you just independently work hard enough and build yourself a stable foundation to pass on then to the next generation, then you're like, life will be worthwhile. Yeah. So much, so often it's not only like practically out of reach for people, but like, it's not a happy it's not a place of abundance. Like true abundance, as we know from the gospel, is elsewhere. It is not yeah. in building ourselves like the firmest foundation through like mm. American wealth gathering. So to live your life in service of that lie and like doubly excluded from the benefits of that lie, it's just mm. a very exhausting way to live. And so the church has such a powerful place to like serve and bless and minister to these communities just by like ministering the gospel. Yes. Um well, and then and, healing from healing, you know, from trauma. Well, and if you're like, if your church has, has professionals in it, obviously any profession in can be helpful. Folks, totally. Anything. Any, well, I mean, and of course, you know, some of our church, we've done a lot of work with refugees. And what I'm always encouraged by in about every city, and I'm always telling every pastor, I know this, there's probably somebody already doing the work. So mm-hmm. just open your eyes and start asking who. Who connects to these different populations in our city who are trusted Mm -hmm. witnesses? Now, sometimes they're believers. Sometimes they're not. Often they are believers, strangely. There's usually some kind of, you know, church or ministry, maybe through food or through healthcare or any number of different avenues are serving populations in your city right now. And they often are already believers. And then if you just show up willing to help, what would be most helpful? What are the biggest problems you're trying to solve? And what is where you just need manpower? You know, because yep. the thing the church can do well is manpower. We might not always have money. Uh, we yeah. might not always have expertise. But, yeah, we can show up in force. You know, we can be there to serve the food. We can be there to pray with people. We can be there to clean up or help out or mm-hmm. do something with child care or whatever. We, yeah. we can, we can offer people manpower. rides, watch people's kids. Exactly. Yeah. And that Help stuff people counts. People show up at the clinic and navigate the language they don't understand. Like, that's exactly right. Out how to use the buses. Like, that's so right. Much. So, yeah. Seriously. And that's what our church has done mostly. And But then out of that, you can build deeper relationships. So we do have some folks in our church who are employing folks. So because they run businesses, because they hire people for a living, that's part of what they do. They can go, well, I can orient some of my hiring more intentionally and hire folks. So I agree with you. There's always things to do if you just go and try and work with people that are already working and you do the work to overcome some of your preconceived notions. Like, you know, don't let Fox and CNN disciple you. Like start asking questions of the humans in your city and don't let the worst cases define the majority Yeah, because what's tough is there are bad stories. There's, there are people that are trying to game any system, any system, name a system. (laughs) There's somebody trying to game it, but to make those people the norm, not the exception. The only way that you can do that is if you don't meet the people, if you actually meet the people, you hear their stories, you see what they're trying to do day to day. You hear where they've come from. You hear how generous they really are. I mean, the amount of immigrants I know who are sending almost all their money back home. It's amazing. That's Mm -hmm. that's more that's more the majority than the minority. You know, they're going, Mm -hmm. I'm solely here because I'm the one that can keep my entire family alive back back home. That's a lot of folks. Or I can offer them an opportunity that they would not have. Yeah. Or if one person can get on the ground, that was one of your buckets, they can create the connections for for more people to, to come towards opportunity. So there's one person who's fighting to make a, a way for a whole bunch of other people. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it just requires getting your hands on it um, yeah. and not just theorizing about it. And the Bible is crystal clear here on how we're to think about refugees, the immigrant among us. Because we're followers of Jesus, we have a text that talks to us about this stuff. We we, oh, yeah. we don't just get to, like, decide based on political persuasion or nationalistic concern. So, yeah, I, I cannot tell you how grateful I am for the work that you do. And I would love to bring you back and ask a whole bunch more questions about this, if, you, if you'd be willing at some point. Because, you know, as we get all the way on the ground with some of these questions in the vineyard, it's just going to take more and more experts 
like you, people that are just doing this day in and day out. And I cannot tell you how grateful I am for you. Most of our vineyard folks would know you from your beautiful singing voice and, you know, the things you've written. But it's amazing to see all the other things you're willing to do to serve the Lord and really serve our movement in this area. So I'm really grateful for you. Thanks. Yeah. And there's a lot, there's a lot of work to do. <laughs> there's so much work to do. There's so much oh work God. to do. So anyway, I'll come back to you if you if you're up for it. I can come back. Sure. I got so many more things. <laughs> I, bet you, I bet you do. There's so much. There's so much there, you know, so much we can learn from as the church. So much yes. about like, you know, how fixated we are on who's deserving and undeserving. How yes. it can be really good for our discipleship to detach our compassion from that sort of thing. Amen. Um, you know, uh, all sorts of ways that there's parallels for us and like how Jesus makes a way for us citizenship in heaven when there's like, you know, we are actually undocumented here on earth anyway. Mm. <laughs> We're not undocumented there, you know. Yeah. Um, so. Oh, I can't wait. Well, I'll come back to you. Thanks, Tina. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. The We Are Vineyard podcast is a production from the team at Vineyard USA. If you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. Leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Connect with us online for additional resources. Our website is vineyardusa.org. And we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at at VineyardUSA. Thanks for listening. See you next week.